So welcome, Perry, to Escape the Rat Race Radio. How are you doing today? It's a beautiful day in Chicago and uh, happy to be talking to uh, a Britain person. So uh, looking forward to having this conversation today. Yeah, me too. When was the last time you were over in the UK, Perry? Um, three weeks ago. Oh, seriously? Um, yeah. In fact, um, now this is a whole different topic, but I have a technology prize called the Evolution 2.0 Prize, and I announced it at the Royal Society on May 31st, and uh, it was written up in the Financial Times two days later. So um, that's that's probably the most prestigious thing I've ever been associated with. So that was pretty cool. Well, I obviously missed that one. Well, congratulations on that and um, hope you had a good time over here on your visit. So I love London. It, <laughs> London is a fantastic, energetic place. Uh, first time I went to London, I thought it was going to be kind of the stodgy Big Ben sort of a place. No, 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 no. It's like the most multicultural, high energy, um, fast moving it's got a vibe. Uh, yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm very pleased to hear that. Now, Perry, you're someone that I, you know, I've known and heard about you for many, many years when I first got into online marketing and really started dipping my toe into the world of business. And for me, that first foray was actually network marketing back in 2004. <laughs> and, and I know that you have some experience as well back in the early days of, of that industry yes. as well, right? Which some people may refer Absolutely. to as MLM. Um, so yes. we, we can maybe touch on that, but I'm keen to understand, sure. Perry. Um, obviously, people know you now as obviously best-selling author and uh, you know expert, certainly for online marketing with sales and Google AdWords. But was there a time for you, Perry, when you would say you were in the so-called rat race and you were trading time for money? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I call it bologna sandwiches and ramen soup and, you know, running out of the house at seven o'clock in the morning, trying not to spill yogurt on my shirt and getting in my 13 year old car with a, a broken, um, like the display doesn't work because the light burned out on the radio. So you have to, you know, oh yeah, presets number six. I know what that station is. And, um, you know, and you have this job and nobody really respects you and it's always like what have you done for me lately and perry you know you didn't get in your sales report and you know all this kind of nonsense right and and so this was uh, like years of this and we were up to our eyeballs in debt um in fact we had to, in order to you know there's this point with debt where it starts like stacking up and like just getting worse. And we had to go to my wife's dad and get a bridge loan so that we could make some of it disappear so that we could restructure it. I mean, and like there's tons of people, you know, the drill. Um, and, and yeah. And then you got like three toddlers and, um, oh, and, and then you and your wife get in some argument about how you should unload the dishwasher and it turns into World War Three, <laughs> and there's just like stress yeah. everywhere. Uh, oh, yeah, I could wax eloquent about that. Um, believe me. Yeah. Um, and so what was the turning point? Like, was there a point where you <clears throat> realized that if you continued down that same path of just turning up at a job every day, that that wasn't going to end up in the place that you wanted to be? Well, in my case, I figured out really early that I wanted to be on the entrepreneurial path, but that didn't mean I knew what I was doing. Okay, so I actually figured out I really want to be on the entrepreneurial path by the time I was about 21 or 22. Um, and I was in Amway and doing the MLM thing and, and I'd already, I'd gotten fired from three jobs. And so I knew how fragile and vulnerable everybody is, right? Which I, I just don't think most people realize how easily somebody can puncture their little bubble that they live in, right? Like all it takes is like uh, a company buys out another company or a market slows down or uh, some management person gets replaced by some other management person. And now we're doing this instead of that. And like, so, so I, I knew that, but then I, I was really kind of drinking the pink Kool-Aid and, 
you know, on kind of really on the wrong track for a long time. And I was trying to shove square pegs into round holes really, really, really hard. So a low point was when I so I, I got fired from my an, yet another job. It was actually laid off. I got laid off from an engineering job. I went into sales. It was my first sales job. And a year and a half into my first sales job, it's not working. And I'm hanging on for dear life. And then I got demoted, which is a whole story. And I, boy, I can like vividly remember one day is like a really hot day in the summer. And I'm out in the parking lot during lunchtime. And I can like, I can see the, tr the freight train coming. It's like... <laughs> You know, I've probably got it maybe a month or two, maybe three before the yogurt really hits the fan here. Um, and like, what are we going to do? And what am I doing wrong? And what am I pretending not to know? And what set of assumptions do I have really wrong here? Um, and cause man, I got like, I got to get my head straight cause th this is not, this is not working. And I, I can't just plaster over with hope and, you know, slogans and yeah. Mot uh, motivational you know, quotes and everything oh, will yeah. be okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, and, and, and I, th one of the turning points was, I had done this thing at my church two or three years before this, where everybody did this giftedness inventory. They had actually gone out and bought some assessment from some pretty cool company that had, you know, one, one of these really cool assessments, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, assessments can be quite useful. And, and, and it was, uh, it wasn't just like a thing where you get on a computer and you check boxes. It was, you do these exercises with people and, 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 and you write, they write down observations and, and, and I, when we had done that, it said, Perry, you should be doing this and this and this. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. Uh, I want to, I want to do these sorts of things because the people I admire and, you know, the people I wish that I was, they're like doing this other stuff. And so I was like, maybe I should get out that assessment, take it really seriously. And I went home and I had the notebook and I got it out and it was like, okay. And, and, and you now here's what it was to, 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 to communicate a, a useful skill to everybody and, and not just tell a story. You are going to be successful being who you are. Mm -hmm. you are not going to be successful pretending to be somebody else. Okay. Nobody got famous doing a really great Jimi Hendrix imitation. Okay. Um, they got famous by sounding like themselves. Okay. Carlos Santana sounds like, Carlos Santana and you can recognize him in 10 seconds and Eric Clapton sounds like Eric Clapton and you can recognize it in 10 seconds. Now that makes success as much of an inner journey as it is any of this external stuff of what techniques am I going to learn and what skills am I going to pick up? And yes, of course you're going to go to seminars and you're going to buy courses and you're going to do all these kinds of things. But but, you know, people are going to love you and hate you for all the same reasons. And they're because you're you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And the love list and the hate list are generally going to be the same list. Well, I love him because he's just so spontaneous and impulsive. I hate him because he's so spontaneous and impulsive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and so I I looked at that notebook and it was like, okay, this is actually telling me the truth because this is going, what they had done is they'd said like, well, tell me a story when you're six years old and tell me a story when you're 12 and, you know, and tell me a story from your career. And, and it was, there was a pattern in there. It was like, okay, so every time you've been successful, 
it's tended to have these ingredients. And I think many times we are so dissatisfied with our situation that we just want to get away. So, for example, everybody's seen some kind of advertisement. It's got, let's say, for instance, that it's some get rich in real estate thing, mm -hmm. okay? And there's a guy, and he's got his foot up on the bumper of a Rolls Royce, and he's got his elbow on his knee, and he's looking at you, and he's got a Rolex, and there's a McMansion behind him, yeah. you know, and it says, like, you too can be as successful as, okay, now that is what is said, okay, but the truth is what is written between the lines, and what is written between the lines is, you loser you scraped 89 cents out of your car seats yesterday to buy lunch at Taco Bell and bill collectors are stacking up voicemails on your phone and you are an idiot. Okay, that <laughs> that is what that ad with the guy in the Rolls Royce means, okay? And they're selling you like another ticket to the good ship yeah, hope. Yeah. Okay. Now, the guy, if if you scraped 89 cents out of your car seats yesterday to buy lunch at Taco Bell, you resent your situation so much that you probably don't realize that your situation has a bunch of assets that you need to hang on to, okay? And it's like, well, there's some stuff you really, really, really need to keep, and there's some other things you need to get rid of, and... And that's the that's the truth of it. Um, and and so, if if you okay, we're talking to the guy scraped eighty nine cents out of your car seats for lunch yesterday. Okay, if if ten years from now, if you've got a net worth of five million and you're making a comfortable mid six figure income and all your bills are paid, you will still essentially be the same person you are today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You're not going to be, now you might be 15 or 20% different, but you're not going to be 50 or 75% or a hundred percent different. In terms of okay. pers personality, and, right? Yes. Yeah. Your personality and your, your basic approach to, you know, to people and, and everything. And, and so, like I, I think, and I had more than I thought I had, but I was, I was burying my talents, if you will, mm. um, and and I was trying to, oh, I was, I was trying to be Jimi Hendrix because I like Jimi Hendrix, and it's like, well, okay, that's fine, but you need to be you. Yeah, and would would you say the onset of social media has just absolutely accelerated this now for people? Because as you say, you've got those images in your face, like all over the place now and and who knows what's real and, and what's not real but unfortunately oh, yeah. that's the that's the the image that's out there everyone's successful you know and if you're not you're just a loser what are you doing wrong you know and you start hating yourself yeah yeah well and you i can tell you for a fact that you can't trust most of the news you get in the, in the news media because most of the time the news media misreports what's going on. So you, you don't really actually know what's going on. All you have is you've only been told one story. So that's all you got to go on. And so there you go. And then, yeah. in and in social media, everybody is kind of trying to be the best narcissist that they can be. And, um, and look, uh, rarely, rarely are the interiors as good as the exteriors. They're just, they're just not. And well, that means y you might not be as bad off as you really think you are. <laughs> and um, frankly, I just, I, I barely am on social media at all. I advertise on social media. I spend money pushing things out into social media, but like I, I'm pretty much not on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter. I mean, those things get just a tiny sliver of my time. They sh they certainly should not get a large portion. Um, yeah. It's a huge mistake. Yeah, huge. 
So lesson number one there, I think we can take from that is, you know, find your own flow and be comfortable in that. And when you do that, you'll be more authentic, you'll enjoy what you're doing, and you'll hopefully start to attract more of the good stuff and good people towards you. Well, and, and, and know who you are and what your giftedness is. Um, and look, um, probably, I'm going to guess most people listening, you know, you've probably had a number of different jobs, uh, a number of educational experiences, maybe several careers. And the most likely place that you're going to hit pay dirt and make real money is going to be in the existing skills that you already have, but maybe combined in a different way than you've combined them before. I think everything can come in useful and handy. Um, you know, even if you've been in three completely different industries, well, if you're going to be starting today, you're going to try to be successful it's going to be in one of those industries that you've already been in. It's not going to be some brand new one where, hey, we're going to go into that market and make a killing, and then we're going to come out with our big bag of gold. That doesn't happen very often. Um, one of the best, one of the best ways to decide who you're going to sell to or what market you're going to be in is, I will only. I will only sell to markets where I have been the person I am selling to and I have already walked a mile in their shoes and I can read them a page in their diary so accurately that it's almost scary. Okay, so if you worked in the mortgage industry for five years, you can you can do that for a loan officer. You can, you can read them their diary exactly. And if you were a nurse or a medical person, then you could go into that business and, and read it. And, and you, not only that, you're also likely to know what the unsolved problems actually are. Like, well, nobody's actually, you know, everybody complains about X, but nobody's really solved it. Okay. So... Get some duct tape and some baling wire and some sticks and some erector sets and like put something together that solves that problem. Yeah. Um, it, it's, yeah. So we're starting to move into obviously the conversation around marketing now and, and kind of almost the 101 marketing is that, you know, identify a problem and the bigger the problem, the more money you can make from that. And of yep. course, if it's an industry or something you've got experience in, then of course, as you've rightly said there, you know, you should understand that much better and be able to kind of get that moving quicker. And I think that's a challenge for many people who are stuck in a rat race is they're in that bubble of doing the same thing over and over. They only have to kind of do, you know, the bare minimum just to get paid every month. And it's that trap that you get caught in because it's not painful enough to do something about it. It's okay. But when people start looking outside of that bubble, I think overwhelm hits them because there's just so much that they could do. And you've got people coming from all directions saying you can be super successful in real estate. You could be super successful trading the market, super successful selling on Amazon. So that's perhaps where people then just don't do anything because the fear of which way to turn just stops them. Well, w one of the big steps was I got straight in my head, okay, this is what I'm actually good at. These are the ingredients that, as objectively as I know how to be, these, these are what I have actually been successful, like doing these sorts of things. And I, I got it straight and I got a list. And I said, okay, the next job I get, it needs to have less of this stuff and more of that stuff. And the next job I got, I think because for about three or four months, I was super clear about, about what I needed to do, that the next job fit the bill perfectly, okay? Now, it was still a stressful job. It was a tiny little company. They didn't have a lot of money. They were always struggling with stuff, but the job was in my wheelhouse. And I took that job super seriously. I treated it 
the way you should treat a business. Okay. And I would come in about seven o'clock in the morning. I would, I would usually come in early. There was, there was a lot of writing that needed to be done because, because it was a marketing, there was a lot of marketing in that job, but it was first and foremost, a sales manager job. My boss did not want to see me typing at my keyboard at 10 o'clock in the morning. He wanted to see me on the phone talking to customers and all that. So I would come in and I would do marketing stuff before eight o'clock in the morning. And then I would switch gears and I, I, I would put a lot of stuff in place and that went really well. And a few months into that job, I was working late one night and the only other person in the, in the company was the owner. And he goes, he sits down and he goes, so Perry, how do we, keep you around. Well, nobody had ever said that to me at any job until then. Mm. I was always the misfit or it's like, yeah, Perry's okay, but whatever. Um, and, and we eventually worked out a stock option agreement, golden handcuffs, as they say. And, and then I, I even doubled up on my efforts, like, okay, like we got to make this thing successful. And it was, um, we sold the, at the end of four years working there, we sold the company for $18 million to a public company. And I got a, a part of that, um, in stock options and, and that was a really big deal. And then I hung out my shingle and I hung out my shingle in the same industry I was already in basically doing freelance what I had been doing at the job and having three or four clients instead of one employer. And that was a wonderful transition. Now, I think the truth about most freelancers is they're okay. The world does not want another okay freelancer. The, the world wants really good people who are at least really, really, really good at one thing or maybe two or three things. And they could be these narrow areas, but you like, there's, there's no, it's like, if you get on Yelp, who wants another three and a half star restaurant? Okay. Yeah. Why? And, and it just, it boggles my mind that, that people, they, they make themselves available. There's tons of consultants. There's tons of freelancers. You know, you go on Upwork and all these different sites and there, there's all these people and most of them are just trying to do good enough. Well, you know, it's kind of a B minus. No. Well, it's often that trap, isn't it, Perry, of someone who's in a job and then they get good at that job and they think, hey, I don't need my boss. I can go off and, and just earn the money directly myself. And really, they just become self-employed and end up working twice as long and half the amount of money. And it's not really owning a business, is it? Well, right. And now, look, it's, it's perfectly OK to be a freelancer and not really, truly own a business. I mean, I mean, that that's a that's a great starting point. It, it, at least it it gives you access to other opportunities that can come along and it gets you in contact with more people. Um, but you know, being like, you have to be better as a freelancer than you have to be as an employee. Um, like just like tit for tat, job for job, skill for skill. I think the freelancer has to be, 50% better because they're a hundred percent easier to get rid of. Right. Employees, you know, they're around and people make friends with them and they become part of the culture and then like getting rid of them is like, Oh, well, I don't know. Do, do we really want to fire Susie? You know, she, she has a really beautiful smile and she's really nice. And well, the only problem is she's sort of incompetent, but that can be hidden. Right. But, but you can't hide in incompetence when you're a freelancer or an entrepreneur. And that usually means you need to narrow what you do. Um, and, and you need to be absolutely remorseless and relentless about honing your skills. Mm -hmm. And so when I was a freelancer, um, 
as I was doing what I was doing now, but it was the 15 years ago version of it when all this was much, much smaller, I would go to the best marketing seminars I could afford and I would learn all of the stuff and I would go home and I would implement it for clients. And my rule was in the land of the blind, the man with one eye gets to be king. And I'm, I'm going to serve clients where the marketing in their industry is terrible and most people have never seen, you know, these advanced marketing things. And so we're going to inherently be better than everybody else. And frankly, I can be way better than all the competitors in my sleep, right? And then you get into a positive cycle. It's like, well, you know, every three, four, five, six months, I go to another really cool seminar and I get a big head buzz and I meet a bunch of people and I learn a bunch of new things and, right, and I can afford to do it because, because I, I am making enough money and, you know, and the thing really is a virtuous circle and you, you've got to get in that circle. And then when you get in that zone, see something, something that um, most people don't know is that really the reason it's hard to find really, really good freelancers is if you're a really, really good freelancer, either a big opportunity for somebody to take you off the market and have you in house comes along that you can't resist, which is fine, or an opportunity for you to own something, own an asset, manifest itself. And now you can't, now you're not available for freelance work anymore. And people don't realize that if you're really, really good at, at what you do, you're only going to be working as a freelancer for two or three years, and then you're going to graduate to some higher level. Um, but I think a lot of people, they just stay stuck in, well, you know, my skills are good enough. They don't invest aggressively in themselves. Now, this is a really fine line. A, there's all kinds of people that'll hang bright, shiny objects in front of your face in and try to vacuum out your wallet with all, uh, okay, oh, you should be in real estate or you could make so much money in affiliate marketing or you could, you know, and there's like all of these things, right? And that is very dangerous. But nevertheless, the truth is, is you need to be willing to invest in yourself. I have invested minimum five figures in myself every year for at least 15 years. Okay, and, um, you know, you add it up, it's a good fraction of a million dollars that I have spent on my education. And most of the people that I know that are really successful entrepreneurs are like that. It may come in different ways, in different forms, but they're willing to spend the money. They, they understand that it's a no-brainer. My, my wife understood that. You know, we, um, she... When when she figured out this stuff worked, she was like, "Okay, you should go to that seminar." <laughs> yeah, she she knew there'd be you know less money for tennis shoes and all that other stuff, yeah. but she knew it would pay off. Yeah, there was a great quote from one of my previous guests, Dan Waldschmidt, and and he said, "Success is a lagging indicator." I don't know if you would agree with that, in that you have to invest uh, yes. up front, right? And sometimes you might not see things happening straight away, and that's where many people will just give up. But you've got to yes. keep pushing on, right? Yes, yes, and um, you know, I I can't tell you how long it's going to take. Uh, one thing I can tell you is, most of my clients are people who've been through not one but two failure cycles before they got to me. Um, you know, they they got into real estate and they lost their butt doing that, and then they got into some other thing, and then that didn't work out either. Um, and they're still in, and then when they got to me, they're still in the game, but now they're ready to learn. I think one of the unfortunate truths about entrepreneurs is usually for the first through couple years, they want the unicorns and candy corns version of business instead of the real version, because there's a really sexy version of how the world works that sells really easily and people will buy it easily. And then after you've been fooled a few times and you're like, okay, no, I want the real business education. 
Um, and I, I can't sell the candy corns version. I, I'm just incapable of that. And I'm not as hypey and I'm a lot more brutal and direct about what it really takes. And it scares people away. But if you're ready, if you're ready, then, okay, then you're ready. Um, and that's where the real discoveries start kicking in. And then that's, that's very rewarding because, because then you start earning compound interest on the real education. And again, you're in the virtuous circle.